Woohoo! Long unit on learning. Uh, this one was about six lectures long. We did a lot of practice with this in class. There's a lot of vocabulary and a lot of examples. So that's my main advice for you for unit six is to know examples. So I'll go through some examples here. Hopefully a lot of this so are things that you've learned before and uh, will come back very easily. So remember that our unit on learning is really broken into two big things, classical and operant conditioning. Classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and then that third one a little bit learning by behavior. So a lot of names in this unit, a lot of examples, a lot of research. So this was actually one of the first parts of psychology that became a big um, push on experiment. So we'll talk about like Pavlov and Skinner uh, and Bandura here in just a second, but big push to make it empirical. A lot of evidence, a lot of research, uh, and a lot of things learned with animals that we then apply to humans. So remember that learning is a change in behavior, right? So when you learn something, it's a change in behavior. Uh, habituation, these are just a list of vocabs, but a habituation is making a habit of something that makes like the learning that's happened uh, faster. So it becomes a habit. You can think of those type of things that you've learned very early on that are just habits for you raising your hand, right? And we'll talk about the process of habituation or learning how fast things become habits. Uh, and then associative learning means like when you uh, associate one things with another. So these three things right here are habituation, I'm sorry, are associative learning. Classical operant and observation is when you associate one thing with another that may or may not have been associated before. So that's the big difference between classical and operant we'll talk about in a second. Classical things that usually are associated and you're just putting in another type of stimulus or response and then operant are two things that didn't used to be associated that you make associated and observational learning is when you learn by watching other people learn. So let's start with classical conditioning. So classical conditioning versus operant conditioning, remember that's where I take two things that are related usually. So usually related. So lightning and thunder. That's not something that's uh, uncommon, right? There's usually lightning with their thunder. You usually drool when you eat food, right? So classical means these are classic things that are related. What happens in classical conditioning then or learning is when you, there's a some type of response that happens without the second stimulus. So this one talks really quick about there's usually of lightning and my stimulus of thunder causes me to, oh my gosh, right? So it's really loud. I usually cover my ears or I like kind of brace for the thunder like that's going to help or something. And what happens after repetition uh, is when we see the lightning, we automatically wince. We have that response even though the thunder hasn't come yet, right? So this is a, a response without the second stimulus. So this is classical conditioning versus operant. Remember, operant operates on the behavior. So a normal, I'm sorry, a normal response would be like lightning and thunder. An un related event is something like balancing a ball. So seals are not usually um, in the wild out there like balancing balls and being really excited about it, right? But if I make a seal balance a ball and then give him a food, something that reinforces the behavior, the behavior strengthened, he's more likely to balance it again. So these are unrelated events. They're totally dependent on the behavior. Right, and they're totally dependent on the learner. We'll talk about how some things are response, or I'm sorry, are uh, uh, reinforcers for some people, are not reinforcers for other. So operant operates on the behavior and the person, right? Versus this is a pretty universal response to lender. I'm sorry thunder and lightning. So let's go back to classical conditioning. This is Pavlov. Remember that Pavlov's dogs, right? You probably have heard this in a lot of their situation. He's the one that did a lot of the research on the classical conditioning. Uh, they're all big behaviorist, right? So behaviors are, if you, a behavioral psychology means that you're totally dependent on your environment, that your environment shapes you completely and you have to be able to observe the behavior in order to make it a science, right? So it has to be an observable behavior. So classical conditioning Pavlov and his dogs. I am Ivan Pavlov, again I talked about he's the one that really made that an experimental procedure. What he did, remember with his dogs, I'm going to skip this and go back down here. He started noticing that he gave food and the dog started to drool or salivate. He then put in a neutral stimulus like a bell that indicated that the food was coming, right? So food, salivate, right? So drooling when I see food. He then would ring a bell, ding, give the food 
and then the dogs would uh, salivate after they saw the food. So bell, food, drool. Bell, food, drool. He then, though, got rid of the food and realized that even when just seeing the or hearing the bell, the dogs would drool, right? So he conditioned them to, with a neutral stimulus, to know that the food was coming. All right, so we've talked a little bit about this with your bells ringing in class, right? If you usually eat lunch after the bell, when that bell rings, you might like start getting hungry, right? Like you know it's coming up. So let's go back to the vocab for this that you'll need to know. The unconditioned versus the conditioned. So unconditioned, remember these are things that are, are the person doesn't teach you, right? So unconditioned stimulus, stimulus is the thing in the environment that creates a response. So in this case, it was the food, right? The unconditioned response was the drooling. So you don't need to teach them. You can kind of think of conditioned as taught or learned. So you don't need to teach them that food equals drooling. The conditioned stimulus then was the bell. This is the thing that we paired up that made a response now that didn't before. So in nature, you don't usually like hear a bell and then start to drool. But the two started to be interconnected so that they knew that when they heard a bell, they would get food. And so the conditioned response is the drooling without the food. Right? So they paired up the bell, food, drooling, bell, food, drooling, so that to the point where the dog just heard the bell and then started to drool even though there's no food. Classical condition, here's another one. Uh, the unconditioned stimulus is usually when you kiss someone, your response is that you feel romantically aroused, right? You feel emotions towards that person. So these are not learned. You don't need to teach someone that when you kiss that it feels good, right? That's just something that's natural. It's biologically natural. But let's say that the person that you're kissing always eats onions. Now when you kiss them, you feel romantically aroused. So the point can go through where now you just smell the onion breath and you feel aroused. So this is the conditioned stimulus and the conditioned response, right? My unconditioned are the first two that happened naturally. So what Pavlov, some interesting things he found, uh, acquisition was how long it took for the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus uh, to be paired. So acquisition is kind of like how long it takes you to acquire or the time related to it. And then the higher order conditioning, remember those are things that were beyond the two conditioned and unconditioned that still got related. So it might be any type of bell. Um, other things that get associated with that original conditioning, higher order conditioning. So this is the graph, remember, we talked about. So here's time. Here's the strength of the conditioned response. So strength is like how much they would drool so that over time it got stronger, right? So over time, once you start associating those two things together, the, the dogs start to drool more um, because the, the, what I want to say, the, um, the response became stronger. So... Let's go down here. Here's extinction. So extinction is how long it takes you to stop associating those two things, right? And so if acquisition is how long it takes to learn it, when I remove the, uh, the food, so if I just started ringing a bell and stopped giving the dog food, then it takes some time to extinct or go away, right? So the dog would stop drooling when he heard the bell because he learned that I don't get food anymore. So extinction is how long it takes for that learned behavior to go away. So spontaneous recovery, uh, someone said this to me the other day and it was great. So spontaneous recovery is how fast that it takes to once that, um, that you start pairing the two together, that it spontaneously comes back. So the strength is just as much, right? And so I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning. I stop getting food once I hear a bell. So my drooling stops, but then all of a sudden one time I get food with the bell, oh, right back here to the strength and then going back here. So here's spontaneous recovery of the conditioned response. So Pavlov also learned the generalizations. Um, oh gosh, I think I talked about this with higher order thinking. So generalization is when you take one thing and then you generalize it to another. So it might be a one specific tone and then it's all tones, right? So you start generalizing one uh, conditioned stimulus to all conditioned stimulus. Uh, discrimination then is when you start going the opposite, where you discriminate between one bell and another. I know that this is the sound of my, um, we talked about this with cars, that sometimes when you, you know like the sound of your parents' cars, you can discriminate. Like it used to be like you got excited every time your parents or you heard a car going by because you thought your parents were coming home, but over time you get able to discriminate between 
the sounds of cars and you know when it's your parents and when it's not. So extending a little learned helplessness, when we talked about when they start to pair things together that are bad so that every time I hear a bell, I get a shock, right? Uh, that people can learn or dogs can learn learned helplessness. That means they start just associating those two things and they stop trying. So every time I hear a bell, I get shocked, right? Every time I <laughs> say hear the word quiz, I fail and they start uh, to stop trying or they stop trying because they just know that they're not going to um, to do well, right? So learned helplessness. They learn over time that they're they're helpless. Uh, so extending, uh, here's some more we talked about with humans, the unconditioned stimulus. So having a drug that makes you nauseous. These two things are not learned, but if you already always start waiting in the same room for a drug at the doctor's office that makes you sick, every time you wait in the room, then you feel sick. So here's the conditioned. Um, uh, part of the classical learning, okay? Uh, we don't need to go through that. Pavlov's leg legacy then, remember we talked about baby Albert. He started being shown a bunny and then the loud sound and he started crying to the point where he just was shown a bunny and then he started crying and then we talked about over time though it'd go away. So if the loud sound stopped happening every time he saw a bunny then he'd stop being afraid of the bunnies. Poor baby Albert. Operate conditioning then is totally dependent on the respondent behavior and the, the, the operant conditioning that's going on. So just because it's a reinforcer or punishment for one person does not mean it's a reinforcer or punishment for another. And so Edward Thorndike is the one that really talked about uh, the law of effect. He's the one, remember we talked about there's not a lot of laws, but he is the one that figured out that if a behavior is punished, it will decrease. If a behavior is rewarded, it will increase. And so Skinner worked with the Skinner box with rats and then trying to get through the puzzle box uh, with reinforcers and punishments. All right, but law of effect, if you are punished for it, it'll stop. If it will, if you're rewarded for it, it will increase. But remember that those two things have to be a punishment or reward to that person. So here's his operant chamber. If you can remember the operant changer is Skinner's box. He's the one that taught the people, or the people, <laughs> the rats how to push the bar um, in order to get food, right? So the food was a reinforcer, and so it increased the behavior of pushing the bar. Uh, shaping then is how I get, so if I want to get that rat to push the bar, shaping then is a way of successive approximations or getting them to that behavior uh, with, and uh, what I want to say, and rewarding them as they get closer. So if I want them to touch a bar that's over here, maybe I reward them just as they start getting closer. By saying, you know, like it's almost like you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer. And successive approximations is mean that as I start being successful approximately, I get rewarded for that. Discriminative use stimulus, so this is where we start to discriminate between two things. So the rat starts to realize if I go this way, I don't get food. If I go this way, I do. So discriminating between the two and getting rewarded for the things that uh, that, that you want to see behavior-wise. So remember in the types of reinforcers, you have positive and negative reinforcements. And I want to put this back here. Remember that it's totally dependent on the respondent's behavior, that the person or the rat or the dog has to view it as a reinforcement and or a punishment in order for it to work. So remember that positive does not mean good Negative does not mean bad. Positive means that there's something added to the situation. Negative means that there's something taken away. Remember that a reinforcer is going to increase the chances that the behavior happens again. So reinforcement means that it's going to happen again. Punishment means that it's not going to happen. So here's your example. So the positive reinforcement, something being added. So adding a desirable stimulus, getting a hug, receiving a paycheck, right? So those two things would increase the chance that the behavior happens again. A negative reinforcement would be removing something, an adverse stimulus that the person doesn't like. So fastening a seatbelt to turn off a beeping, right? So I'm removing something that they don't like in order to increase the chances that it happens again. We'll talk about punishment in a second. So primary reinforcers, those are things that uh, are, oh, what was I going to say, reinforced a biological need. So primary, food, water. Conditioned reinforcers and secondary reinforcers, these are things that we learn that have reinforcing value. Um, conditioned reinforcer means that, uh, oh gosh, I don't know, 
uh, money, right? We talked about secondary reinforcers or generalized reinforcers. So money stands for something else, right? Immediate versus delayed reinforcers. If I get it immediately, it's stronger. If it's delayed, it might not be as strong, but they're still as effective. Continuous reinforcement. Oh my gosh, the schedules of reinforcement. So let me just show this next one here. Remember that when reinforcement, again, I'm making it happen again. Fixed versus variable, ratio versus interval. So a ratio is a number, an interval is time. So a ratio, if it's fixed, so ever so many, reoccur the behavior occurs. So if I buy 10 coffees, I get one free thing. So a fixed ratio. Could be one to one ratio, it could be one to 10. A variable, so it's after an unpredicted number, the behavior is rewarded. So this says like playing a slot machine or fly casting. So after ever so many times I put my fly, or after every, sing, um, every so many times I pull a lever, I get reinforced. Versus time, ever so often. So reinforcement behavior is a fixed time, such as Tuesday I get discount prices, right? So every Tuesday or over after a week I get discount prices. A variable amount of time is unpredictable, right? So reinforcement for behavior after a random amount of time, as in checking for email. So it's been a certain amount of time, I check for email, sometimes it's five minutes, sometimes it's 20 minutes before I get an email, so different amounts of time. Here was Skinner in his box again, the reinforcement schedules, looking at the number of responses or the behaviors and the amount of time. So if you get a fixed ratio, which means the rat knows that every 10 times I press a lever I get food, that, that it happens very quickly. I get responses very quickly. If he knows that there's a variable amount of times I press, the response happens quickly as well, but not as quickly as the fixed ratio, right? So here are the reinforcers. So I get it right here, right here, right here, right here. Time then, right? So fixed interval. So look at this as if I know like after five minutes I get it, right? Or every hour I get it. It takes more time to, for those number of responses to increase. And then the variable interval, this is looking at how fast they're learning. So this whole thing is looking at how fast we're learning. Um, opposite then of reinforcement then are punishments. So punishments can be positive or negative as well. Remember that positive means that something's added, negative means something's taken away. So positive punishment, I'm decreasing the behavior. I don't want that behavior to happen again. So positive would mean when I add something that they don't like, like a spanking or a parking ticket. So I'm adding something to the situation that the person doesn't like. Negative punishment is when I take something away that they do like. You're grounded. You don't get to go out, right? You don't, you get your cell phone taken away. I'm taking something away that you like to decrease the chance that you'll do that thing again, okay? So positive added, negative taken away. Um, oops, did I just skip one? No. Um, so operant conditioning and thought processes. So latent learning, remember we talked about that this is, uh, latent learning is learning that happens after. So sometimes you create a cognitive map even though it wasn't rewarded or punished at the time, um, but that later you'll remember. Insight learning is that kind of like aha moment that occurs. And then you have intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Sometimes you're intrinsically motivated to learn something to change your behaviors. Sometimes you're extrinsically motivated. Remember that intrinsic motivation has a higher rate of keeping that behavior. So if I want to lose weight, because I just want to be a healthy person and I want to live longer for my kids. That's intrinsic, right? Versus I want to lose weight because if I lose 10 pounds, I get $100. So I might lose weight very quickly for that extrinsic, but as soon as this goes away, my behavior goes away as well. Versus the intrinsic, your behaviors are more likely to stay. Um, uh, remember we talked about there's some biological constraints on learning. So I can't teach an elephant to do flips no matter how much I try and reinforce it or punishment. Uh, basic idea. So I'm going to go back down to this chart here. Wow, it's long. There you go. Basic idea of, of classical conditioning. There's learned associations. Uh, basic of operant. I associate things with behavior because of punishments. And so anytime I see punishments, reward, it's operant. Classical are two things that are already. So responses in classical and voluntary. Operant, totally voluntary. Acquisition, right? So you can read through these two things. And then if you want to go down to biological predisposition. So you're naturally predisposed with the stimulus and response for classical thunder lightning. Operant organisms best learn similar to their natural behaviors. Unnatural behaviors uh, means they'll usually drift back or instinctive drift to go back to their natural runs. So I can teach a seal to balance a ball. 
as long as it's being punished and rewarded, but if it goes back into nature where those punishments and rewards go away, the behavior goes away at well, as well. Last one on learning by observations. Remember, you need to know Bandura. Remember, this means I can watch my brother be punished for something, and I actually don't get punished, but I learn the behavior, right? Ooh, if I do that, I get spanked. I'm probably not going to do that. So I was never rewarded or punished, but I watched someone be rewarded or punished. Right, so this is called social learning or modeling. Remember that there are mirror neurons in our brain that fire in the same places as other people when we watch things happen. So we can feel pain when other people feel pain even though we don't. We can watch someone learn something and do the same thing. This is a lot of how kids learn. They watch by you doing something and then your brain fires in the same exact pattern with the mirror neurons. Bandura and his Bobo doll, remember he's a humanist, Bandura. Um, he's the one that said, uh, Oh, self-learning and, or I'm sorry, self-actualization, all that stuff. So the Bobo doll, he um, left someone in a room with a Bobo doll and made them upset. And then he made a child upset. And what did the kid do? He went and beat up the Bobo doll. So no one ever taught this kid to be upset and to hit something when they're upset, but they learned regardless. Uh, Pro-social versus antisocial. Remember, there's things that we can learn in a good way. So sometimes we can watch people being kind and watch people saying please and thank you and being respectful. And we have good things that we learn versus antisocial effect. Uh, aggression, kids that do video games or watch wrestling when put in the same situation might react the same way if they've seen those things. So pro versus antisocial. 21 minutes on learning. Hopefully you reviewed that. Next one, we're going to go into cognition and memory, looking at how we can uh, change our learning forever, right? So remem remembering that we learned something.